So I have the honor of introducing you to Karen BK Chan. So uh, BK is an award-winning sex and emotional literacy educator in Toronto, Canada, with 25 plus years of experience. Karen, AKA BK, is dedicated to having difficult conversations that are real, transformative, and kind. Known for her accessible style and sense of humor, BK integrates curriculum content into stories and theory into practice. She works with individuals, groups, and organizations, and trains professionals across disciplines. BK's YouTube video jam is used as a teaching resource internationally, and her chapter on the importance of creative play was part of the AASCCT, so the ASAC 2014 Book of the Year. BK's work has also appeared in Toronto Book Award finalist, Any Other Way Coach House in 2017. Sexology International, the Tete Tete, and Action Canada's National Education Manual. In 2014, BK was named Service Provider of the Year by uh, Planned Parenthood of Toronto for her work in sexual health. And she was honored in 2017 as one of 30 Chinese Canadian women of distinction in Ontario. Oh, congratulations for that. BK has training in creative facilitation, production thinking, nonviolent communication, and is a facilitator for YES, which hosts intensive gathering for social change makers worldwide. These influences and more shaped her favorite ways to learn and teach through stories, metaphors, diagrams, and things that make people laugh. Aside from her synchronous work with BK, uh, work with BK, her online courses on emotional intelligence and on LGBTQ plus competence for clinicians are also available. I have to say, along with Flip University, I participated in a 12 week allyship course with BK, and it was fantastic. Um, you're in for a real treat. I'm going to turn it over. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Bethan. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it really means a lot to me um, to have lots of folks gathered for something like this. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And please let me know if you can see my slides. Yep. Yeah, thumbs up. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so again, my name is BK uh, or Karen, I use both uh, names, and I use she or they pronouns, uh, feel free to choose either. And uh, I'm going to be with you for about 75 minutes talking about allyship. It's a big topic, we're just going to dive in today to some of the, the nuances of it. I think um, many of you are quite familiar with the idea of allyship and you already are performing many of the the duties um, that we have as allies so today i actually wanted to highlight some of the nuances so let's start with thinking about what is an ally an ally here uh, i have one of the definitions and you may have others and by the way you're very welcome to join in on the conversation in the chat box or by unmuting and speaking you're not interrupting uh, I welcome your voices and your thoughts throughout this presentation. What is an ally? I'm going to say it may be a person of a person who actively, sorry about the typos, the person who actively rejects injustice and eliminates the marginalization of others individually and systemically. So I'm highlighting both. the individual focus on what somebody said what somebody did but also let's think about systemically how do we become systemic allies how do we be part of systems that change existing status quo problematic systems uh, it's more about being sympathetic it's more than um, being believing somebody who believes in equality 
it's actually typically using whatever power we might have. So the power or privilege that we might have um, within our spheres of influence. So we got to use what we have in order to further this cause of more justice for more people. So let's start by um, seeing who's in the room. I'm curious whether anyone here is left-handed and if so, can you please let us know either in the chat or by speaking up or giving me a, an emoji. Thank you, Samantha. Um, Marnie's also a left-hander. Awesome. Vanessa confesses lefty. Madeline left-handed. Natalie left-handed. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to ask our left-handed guests today to not help us right-handers for now. And Julie as well. You're going to just sit back and watch us flounder. I mean, watch us um, participate. So right-handers, I'm going to invite you to tell me, as you know, it's a right-handers world, right? You know that. It's our world. So show me how. Show me all the ways in which this is a right-handers world. And I'm going to ask the right-handers to put ideas right into the chat. How do you know it's a right-handers world? Often we think about scissors. Scissors um, often are created right-handed, and even when they're created for both hands, um, the way that the blades come together are more effective when used with the right hand. I don't know if you knew that. Computer mice, absolutely. Uh, technology, uh, absolutely. So keyboards, right-handed, our phones, our, our watches, where buttons are. Gear shift. Thank you, Jackie. The very important automobile. And of course, connected to the automobile includes our how we ignite a car, how we start a car, where the key is or the button is. And if it is a key, how a key turns. Chalk or whiteboard. Um, actually, writing of all kinds, you know, the smearing, the famous left handed smear. Uh, notebooks, absolutely, especially if they're spiral bound or those three ring binders that we loved in high school, conventional methods of shaking hands, reaching out your right hand. And of course, why, why is that the convention? It's because I'm trying to show you I'm not armed, right? And I, I would show you my right hand because the convention is you think I'm right-handed, I'm gonna show you my right hand. Doors and how they open, both in how they swing and also how the knob works. If you reach for a knob with your left hand and you wanna open it, it you actually have to turn over your own wrist to get their handwriting in a notebook, coffee mugs. Yes, thank you, Susan, for noticing that. If you have a coffee mug that has a message on both sides, then you're lucky because both the other person and you get to laugh. But otherwise, um, only the right-handers get to laugh. Doors, bottle openers, can openers. Absolutely, that's a uh, one that we often think about. Tristan says, my laptop here is all its ports on the right side, so it's easy to plug the mouse in on the right or you know, your power and so forth. Writing pads, controls in the car, desks at school, you know, the ones that flip over or the one that are stationary and have a big piece of wood coming out to support us on the right side so we can write. Gears of the car, zippers, appliances, placement of controls, yes, microwaves, vending machines, all kinds of those things. Books in general, handshakes, buttons on a shirt. Thank you, Andrew. And um, as you may know that many clothing that's labeled women's clothing uh, have the buttons uh, differently than what's labeled as men's clothing. And that comes from a tradition of Victorian women being dressed by dressers. And so we assume the dressers are right-handed. So then we make the buttons easy for the dressers. Uh, eating beside a lefty at a table. Man, I've, I've been there. Um, and let's talk about the lefties having to eat beside us as righties. Oof. That's got to be one of the hardest parts of being a left-hander is to deal with the right-handers in their lives. <laughs> Thank you, Marnie. Um, wired ringed notebooks. Beautiful. You, as a group, have outperformed any other group that I have been with. And I've been doing this for more than 20 years. So here are some more that I've collected, many of the ones you've hit already. If you have a question about any one of them, let me know in the chat. I just want to highlight for you a very important tool, the ice cream scoop, the one that has a little thumb button that swoops in and pushes that scoop of ice cream out. Dog training conventions are often on the right side. So when you teach a dog to heal, 
you'll probably be taught by a trainer to heal a dog on your right side so that you you know you can handle them on the right side and as a left-hander you can either do whatever the right-handers do or you can flip everything around sewing machines kennedy says is so obvious now yeah especially those of us who use them i'm not one of those people um Yes, language. Thank you, Kathy, for noticing. So all the brown uh, words on the right side, on the bottom right, really highlights the language. And this is where we really see it's not just about the numbers of us, right? Right-handers were numerous. So it makes sense that if I'm going to make 10 hockey sticks, that I'm going to make most, if not all of them, right-handed. That's just a numbers game. But the language actually starts to show us there's a value difference. You know, to be right-handed is to be competent. You know, the word for for ambidext uh, for being you know competent on both sides, ambidextrous. For a long time, I thought it meant you're competent on both sides, but it actually means you're competent as if you're right-handed on both sides. So, if I were to pay you a, a compliment about your competence, I actually have to enact and evoke the idea of right-handedness to compliment your dexterousness. The word dexterous actually means right-handed. It is to do with the right hand. And so we see that this is, in a way, a system that uh, creates different powers, different access, different ease, and different amount of belonging to different groups, the groups being right-handers and left-handers. And so this is something that we could use as a, a loose analogy. And I say loose because it's not a perfect analogy, it's an imperfect one. If, but if we look at the system, we could think about it as similar in many ways to other systems where there's groups given different powers. And so um, a system like racism or race as a system, gender, where there is sexism between, um, where groups, uh, you know, if you call men and women groups in within that system of gender, then there's different uh, amount of access, uh, safety, belonging, and ease accorded to each of those groups. Other systems of power and balance, uh, we know them to be true, you know, um, size, body size, ability, disability, class, uh, and so on. So we can learn like, actually a lot from right-handers, left-handers, and the system that accords the right-handers with privilege, with power, even if we don't want it. Most right-handers don't wake up thinking, I'm going to go and make left-handers life miserable today. I like it and I enjoy it and I'm going to perpetuate that. Most of us actually don't care for it, but that is the nature of privilege. We have it even when we don't want it, even if we don't care for it, even especially when we don't notice it. So what do we learn from this system of power? Some of these things. One is that it's impalpable. Generally speaking, our privilege is impalpable. Uh, when was the last time you even thought, I am a right-hander and I know I had a terrible day today, but at least I was right-handed and all of my microwaves are on the right side and I did not have problems opening my beans so that I could have you know, a proper lunch. I did not have any problems you know, picking up uh, a hockey stick or using a power tool and so forth. So it's impalpable, we forget. Second, false universality. You know, I'm going to just translate. You think everyone lives like you, right? It's not that I don't know that left handers exist as a right hander. I do know they exist, but I forget they exist. So when I set the table, when I create systems within my home, I forget, even though my partner is left handed. It is not ill intentioned. It is not because I actually think they're lesser. It is just that I have right-handed privilege and therefore I start to think that everyone has the experience like me. There's a false meritocracy. I think that the life, you know, life makes sense that A leads to B. If you're careful, then you won't hurt yourself. You know, there's statistics that show left-handers tend to uh, be injured by themselves more often than right-handed people. So much so that, you know, the numbers of left-handers ending up in emergency rooms due to self-injury is much higher. This is a recent study coming out of British Columbia. And if we took an individual approach where the world is indeed meritocratic, 
that if you're careful and you don't get hurt, then we would think, we could easily think that Marnie and other left-handers here are just careless or they don't care or they're distracted or they're just always thinking about artistic things that left-handers are good at, supposedly. But if we take a systemic approach, if we see it as a system, then we see, okay, the world is full of sharp objects and dangerous instruments that are created for right-handers. And if you operate any power tools you know many of them have guards the guards you know close so that you don't touch the blade accidentally they're actually created only for right-handed use primarily and so the world is created so that it would make sense that left-handers injure themselves more often so when we take a systemic approach we see that it's actually not entirely meritocratic that whether we injure ourselves is not based only on individual choice and so we can see, we can superimpose that onto other systems like schooling, who gets kicked out of school, who doesn't get uh, to graduate as, at as high a rate as others. One of the words on uh, the list of uh, right-handed things I've collected is medical instruction. So that means if you're training to be a, a surgeon, all of the um, procedures you be taught would be taught to you right-handed. So imagine two medical students learning suturing, for example, and being tested on suturing. All of these, you know, the right-hander will have a slightly easier time. Now, that doesn't mean that medical school is easy for the right-hander, it's not easy for anyone. But that, that idea, once these two medical students both become amazing and accomplished surgeons, we would have to say that we know while we cannot measure exactly how much, we know that the right-hander has benefited from their right-handed privilege because everything has been taught to them right-handed. Now, because I can't tell you, it's, you know, it's about 8% of their success is due to being right-handed, sometimes it's very hard to talk about these things. And as allies, what we're tasked to do is to talk about it even though it's very abstract, is to recognize it even though I don't feel it. It's just to suspend the very naturally built-in disbelief that I have when I have power. Entitlement to individuality, the idea that I'm exceptional, that uh, I'm not just one of the right-handers, right? Rarely as a right-hander do I get asked to speak for all right-handers. As a right-hander, what do you think about this tool? I'm just me. Whereas as a left-hander, you often get singled out and you get told stories about left-handers. I heard they're very creative. I heard that they, you know, do a lot of lateral thinking very creatively. And the same as other marginalized groups, often we're asked to speak on behalf of the group. We get lumped together. We are uh, sometimes hard to tell from each other. So folks, you know, in your office might say, well, I'm the only one of two people who have a visible uh, physical disability uh, in this workplace, and we get mistaken for each other all the time. I get called her name and she gets called my name. This happens to people of color all the time. This happens to the only whoever, whatever identity all the time because lumping happens. But when we have power, we expect not to be lumped and we expect to be exceptions that I don't get talked about as part of a group. Straight people are so X, Y, it doesn't happen as much. And finally, a discomfort to uh, um, a discomfort or a low tolerance for talking about the stuff. You know, as a person with a smaller body, a thin body, talking about fat phobia, talking about sizeism, sometimes makes me quite uncomfortable, especially when somebody of size is in the room and talking about their experience. It makes me, it, you know, it's painful to listen to. And then sometimes I feel guilty, like, am I at fault? Are they talking about me? Are they complaining about me? I, I certainly have had this experience many times when people are talking about classism. And as somebody who's always been middle class and never struggled that way, it's hard to talk about classism and to talk about, you know, and sometimes to face the anger that folks who've experienced poverty, folks who are uh, working class, who are talking about um, their experience, it's hard to be there. And so as somebody with privilege, I'm often 
actually able to sidestep those conversations. I can be quiet. I can you know, gently leave the room. I can avoid situations where those things can surface. And as allies, we actually have to turn around and get back there and sit at the table and get uncomfortable about it. So let's think about those things we've learned from the systems of right-handed people in a right-handed world or uh, as people with privilege in some way. You know, we all have privilege in some aspects and we don't have it in other aspects. What does it mean for our allyship? So what does an ally do recognizing and knowing that privilege and power is impalpable? What we want to do is listen. Listen is the first one versus do something. So often the motivation is to do something. I got to be quick, got to prove myself, got to prove my allyship, got to perform it. But actually the first thing is to listen. And it, it can be really hard to listen, to notice. Notice everything from my unconscious biases surfacing. Notice everything from how I react when somebody's angry or upset or hurt or disappointed or leaving my uh, company or organization saying that they've had uh, a negative experience or a series of negative experiences. Um, and then critically self-reflect. This can be actually quite challenging. To empathize and broaden our sources. So often as a person with power in a certain realm, my sources become narrowed. Where I get information become narrowed. There, most of our sources actually are always from the dominant sphere. The movies we watch, the books we read, the people we see as our teachers and who have wisdom for us often become narrowed to a certain sector. And that sector is often in the dominant sphere. They have power. I'm mostly listening to right-handers talk about um, stuff. And I'm rarely listening to left-handers unless I want to hear about left-handed things. Right, so that's just a metaphor. I'm not actually choosing which author I read by their handedness. But that our sources sometimes get narrowed. To create opportunities and to step back, to actually think about how I have access, I have belonging, I expect to belong. So while there's nothing wrong with having opportunities, what can I do with the access I have? I can share it. And so sometimes sharing it means I'm going to invite somebody else along. I'm going to help them meet people. We know that connections matter so much. And sometimes it's actually me saying, I'm not going to go. You go. I'm not going to take that opportunity. You take it. Surfacing impalpable group patterns. So if I cannot see myself as a right-hander, because my right-handedness is kind of... Um, I'm kind of oblivious to it. Then I've got to start noticing, well, what are right-handers like? What are people with thin bodies like? We're not just people. There's a certain thing that happens. And what does privilege actually feel like? It's hard to talk about because privilege, often what it means is that certain things don't happen. Right? So when I go to a yoga class for the first time and I show up and I've never met the teacher before, and they see my body. I'm rarely asked, are you sure you're gonna be able to do it at this level? What's your sense, general you know, state of health right now? I'm generally not asked. And when I am asked, I don't feel singled out. Whereas somebody with a larger body will get asked more often. And when they are asked, it will bring back a lifetime of experiences of being questioned, of imagine, being imagined that you're not healthy just because your body is not stick thin. That your, your doctor, when you're there to, you know, get remedies for a headache, will start to question your nutrition, will start to ask you about exercise, versus my doctor might just prescribe some pills for my headache. So I, I got to start noticing what my privilege actually means. What does it actually mean? to get on the phone and sound like I'm quote unquote from here. It means often I don't get my ticket checked twice. It sometimes means I don't get pulled over by a cop. Or when I am, I'm not terrified. I'm like, hey officer, how are you doing today? 
I mean, most people are pretty terrified when they get pulled over. But noticing, actually, what, what does it actually mean? Sure, I, I will acknowledge I have male privilege, you know, but what does it actually mean? It means I'm not scared, perhaps, when I have to drive somewhere at night or walk somewhere at night. It might mean I'm not scared that somebody will think um, or will credit my idea to somebody else. And that's something that many women uh, in the workplace especially talk about. Number five, practice being uncomfortable. This is a big one. We're going to talk a little bit more about discomfort and having courageous conversations. So today we're actually going to focus on these three, number one, three, and five. So let's, let's go. Let's do it. Firstly, to listen, notice, and critically self-reflect. What does that mean? So often when we're talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity, our emotions come in. Often these things are talked about as if they are not emotional, as if they're academic, as if it's just about learning and, and getting past, quote unquote, ignorance. But these things often trigger thoughts about our own goodness. Am I a good person or am I a bad person? Am I progressive or am I regressive? Am I on the right side of history or am I on the wrong side of history? So these things actually become barriers to us really listening. So this is one of the models that I love um, and use over and over in various um, situations. It's called the zones and compass model. And before I head into it, I'm actually just going to close my door. My, do my dog has opened my door and it's very loud. My apologies. So this uh, first model, it's called the learning zone model. It might be familiar to many of you. It's quite simple. It's three circles. And it says all of your life's experiences will land you in one of these three zones. At any moment in your life, I can tell you which zone you're in, or you could tell yourself which zone you're in. And the comfort zone is where things are predictable. You don't actually have to be physically comfortable. If every morning you take a 17 mile run, then that's your comfort zone. That is not a comfortable thing to do. I imagine I've never done it, but I would guess it's not that comfortable but it may be your comfort zone comfort zone is where you expect to be safe and to stay safe your nerves are at rest they're not firing uh, actively outside of the comfort zone is all uncomfortable by definition My apologies, I'm coughing. It's very dry in my house. The two kinds of discomfort that you might experience, stretch zone and panic zone. Stretch zone, which is the yellow circle or the orangey yellow circle here, it says that you're engaged. You're uncomfortable, but you're engaged. The engagement means you're listening you're actually still paying attention. You're taking all of the information in. You haven't just picked out one piece of inf information and amplified it so big that you can't process any other pieces of information. You're able to express yourself and you're able to take in information. Panic zone outside of that means I'm so uncomfortable that I am not engaged. I'm in fight or flight mode. I'm trying to survive. I'm feeling attacked. I'm feeling like my identity is at risk. Maybe my identity as a good leader, as a good person, as a good partner, as a good friend. Um, and sometimes our perception of danger is not on. It is uh, way too sensitive. So sometimes we end up in the panic zone even when we're not actually at risk. In the panic zone, we go into fight or flight. 
And this is the second model I want to share with you. It's called the compass of reactions model. And it further breaks down this idea of fight or flight. Under fight, it says we can attack others or we might attack ourselves. So the attacking is not just outward. Attack others, you know, let's say the thing that sends you into a panic zone is that somebody in a meeting that you thought was going very well says something like, uh, I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, you just used a word that is archaic and it actually does a lot of harm. And in fact, that word is also in the report that you shared with us earlier this week. That might send you into your panic zone. It may not. You might be in your stretch zone, in which case you hear it, you process it, and you think, okay, I have made a mistake. Let me learn about it. And let me own up to it. Let me apologize and so forth. Let me do what's necessary from here on forth. But if it does send you into your panic zone, like it would many humans, and your brain goes into attack others, then you might think, well, who are you to tell me? You might think, I can't believe you brought it up publicly. That is disrespectful. I do not condone that kind of behavior. That's not what we're about here. You might come up with a lot of ways to be indignant. Attack self would be a similar kind of panic, but I'm going to turn that energy of saying everything that's wrong right now, it's your fault. I'm going to turn it around and say everything that's wrong right now is my fault to the point where I might take on responsibility that's not even mine, or I might not be able to stop apologizing. I'm so sorry. I'm so bad. Well, I, you know, I might as well just quit right now, right? I'll never get this right. And the interesting thing about attack self is that so often it looks like humility, which we're asked to practice as leaders and as allies, but it actually is very um, self-focused. It's about me and how badly I feel about what I did, right? And so uh, a motivation to move out of attack self is actually to say, when you're in attack self or when you're in any kind of panic, you are self-focused because you think you're going to die in a, in a metaphorical way, that you're in fight or flight. In fight or flight, you cannot actually pay uh, attention to other things and other people and the bigger picture. And then in flight, you've got withdraw and avoid withdrawing in that scenario of, you know, somebody speaking up in a meeting like that. I might just stop talking. I might just go silent and go, well, then. I won't say anything else since I can't say anything right. Withdraw. I might dissociate. I might still be present physically, but not mentally, not emotionally. Or I might get up and leave. Or let's say I, you know, uh, last throughout that meeting, but after afterwards, I'm going to um, avoid that person. I'm going to not speak to them again. I'm going to avoid all eye contact. All that is withdrawn. That's my brain going into overwhelm. That's not because I'm a terrible person. It's because I'm in overwhelm. Now, when we're leaders, um, we are tasked with getting back to stretch over and over again. That's part of your job. It's human to panic. And as a leader, you got to keep coming back to stretch. And finally, avoid. Avoidance is connected to numbing. So right after the meeting, I go back to my office, you know, I down a half a bottle of Jack Daniels. That would be a way of numbing. I don't want to feel the shame I just felt numbing. Or immediately I get on my phone and I can't, you know, participate anymore in this meeting. I'm just scrolling through whatever. So anything that can numb us could be avoidance. Avoid it also includes people pleasing. People pleasing uh, is when I cannot stand that feeling of, of, you know, being called out. And so I smile and I say everything is great and I say yes, and I'm pleasant always and I'm accommodating. But I'm not actually representing myself truly. So all that would fall under avoidance. And here are some more words to, you know, hash out each of these quadrants attack others being you know about indignation about aggression and hostility blaming others shaming others get off me get away from me you don't like this feeling 
Attack self, turning it all on us, chronic guilt, taking it all on, self put downs, another typo, my apologies. Withdrawing, abstaining, shutting down silent treatments, and then avoiding, appeasing, people pleasing, procrastinating. That's a big one, right? If I cannot stand the feeling of starting to do my taxes, what do I do? I go wash my car, I go clean the fridge, you know, I'll snowshoe for hours, anything but to face that feeling. That's a kind of avoidance. And of course, numbing. Uh, Bethan says, do you have tips for us on how to get back to stretch? Well, I was going to ask you about that. How do you get back to stretch? We may all recognize ourselves in one or many of these quadrants. And often what is the case is we'll start in a certain quadrant and we'll go to another quadrant. You know, first I hold it all in, I contain it, and then I can't do it anymore and I have a blow up. I do some attack others and then right after that I feel so bad and I attack myself. And we might have different patterns in different realms of life, right? In the workplace is one thing. With my intimate partner, it's another thing. With my children, it's yet another thing. But the key question is what Bethan had just asked. How do you get back? And Ben just shared a big panning zone example. I planned a staff dinner during Ramadan and it was brought up in a large staff meeting to change the date. I was embarrassed and it took a long time for me to be comfortable planning other staff events. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. And so the moment that Ben came back to go, okay, I'm listening. What you want is for an event that doesn't happen on a major important holiday. Let's do it. And I apologize, my bad. That was an awful mistake. And that's when Ben came back to stretch zone, right? But before that, the shame, the embarrassment. And each time Ben is about to plan a staff event, Ben gets closer to the panic zone and claws the way back to, to, to stretch and say, yes, I will do it. Yeah, I will. And I would like some help this time. And I, I want to sit down and really talk it out this time, you know, whatever that might be. That is about getting back to stretch. So how do you get back to stretch? Ben, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, I think in this example, I, I had to wrestle with, with the decision to, to, um, to reschedule it because it had been planned. And I think a lot of my reflection was on kind of blaming that person. Like, well, it works for everyone else, right? So why yeah. can't we do it then? And um, I had to really start to unpack that more. And what I realized was I was the problem. You know, mm. I, I wasn't making a, um, an inclusive event. Um, I was excluding um, others. And so I needed to make the change. And I think that's mm. where I started to kind of go more into the stretch, zo stretch zone and maybe even to the comfort zone because I understood what was happening. Um, so mm -hmm. beautiful. So you've just named a few. Some time can help. Perspective can help. Reframing can help. This is not about me. Um, you know, making uh, a, the most effective um, event because I've already been planning it. So let's just go with it. This is actually, we're going to prioritize making sure everyone is included. Julie says, acknowledge, apologize if needed, forgive myself, pivot. Beautiful. Like four important steps. Breathing really helps. And it, you know, it's not just a a uh, sort of like breathe and feel good that that kind of thing but literally in the the stretch zone we are breathing and in the panning zone we are not so often we hold our shoulders up we move forward so up and forward is sort of the panic motif here and then we stop breathing or we hyperventilate and so actually pulling back shoulders dropping it literally embodying that kind of groundedness breathing can really help talking with trusted others can really help tristan says recognizing my own physical physiological tells of when i'm hitting the panic zone yes can let me strategize whether i can get back to stretch right away or i need some time to step away employ other tools thank you that is beautiful insight and that is also a demonstration of personal power the last thing we want is people with positional power, you know, maybe by your title, maybe by your experience, your expertise, your authority, with low personal power, which means I'm often in the panic zone, I'm insecure, and I'm not sure how to get back to stretch zone. 
That is actually a recipe often for abuse of power, not because I'm seeking to abuse my power, but because out of overwhelm, I end up uh, abusing my power. Uh, Eva says, we have someone at our company preparing a calendar that shows different holiday celebrations by various cultures and religions. That's awesome. And maybe that would be a great thing to share with all of us so that we don't each have to have somebody at our company doing the same thing. Uh, ben, did you have your hand up? Or is that from before? That's from before. Okay. So I would use that model anytime about myself to know where I'm at, just like Tristan says, recognizing, because that's half the battle. To know I'm in the panic zone is already half the battle. Because so often I'm in the panic zone, but I don't know it. And I'm just operating as if I have all the information and I'm not um, pigeonholing into something that I'm not just being defensive. So knowing I am and saying I am already half the battle. Let's move to three, create opportunities and stepping back. Really important parts of allyship. One of the guiding principles that I have uh, is we cannot mitigate oppression without mitigating privilege. It isn't uh, just an endless amount of power to be had by all. So, so often folks with power, we want to help. We want to be helpful and we want to be charitable and we want to help um, those who are quote unquote less fortunate, but that actually uh, is uh, being ignorant about something, which is that in order to do that, I have to lose something sometimes, sometimes. So how do we do it? I want to show you some um, examples. Um, these are an array of examples, and I'm not asking you all to quit, just so you know, but I want to uh, demonstrate how so often it is about stepping back. Uh, for those of you who don't know who that is, in the front is Catherine Hernandez. She uh, was an artistic director in, uh, in Toronto, in uh, the theater sector, and she quit. And so that the theater company could hire a black or an indigenous um, artistic director for that theater, and they did. And it was because while she was trying to make change within the theater, it wasn't really working. They were actually trying to really respond to how that theater did not have um, very much uh, you know, black centered content, nor uh, actors and artists who are um, black and or indigenous. Some of you may know this, Alex Ohanian, who uh, is famous, but also uh, a board member, was a board member of a large media entity, uh, Reddit. Um, he quit so that somebody black could head up the organization. Helen Saltzman, um, a great podcast, by the way, The Illusionist, um, she took her show out of this network so that the resources that were available in that network um, could be used by other uh, podcasters who are not white. And because that, that um, network had been accused of a number of racist and exclusionary practices. So as a, a move of allyship, she actually left the network, began, um, uh, continued her show from with a different network and is doing very well. Um, to give it even more of a range to uh, 2021, three Grammy nominees. Uh, this is one set of them declined their nominations to get a Grammy in best children's album category. I think most of us missed that award, uh, but nevertheless, they were uh, nominated to get a Grammy and three sets actually withdrew because the slate only had white artists. And it's interesting, maybe there were only white people making children's music in 2021, but um, that would be a way to question that. What are other occasions that you might be aware of where someone steps back? It doesn't have to necessarily be withdraws entirely or refuses a nomination, but what are other opportunities in your realm, in your circles, where by removing oneself or by sharing power that access can be more equitable? So go ahead and uh, throw that into the chat. 
in the meantime, um, Vanessa had asked, how do we recognize somebody in their panic zone? Uh, when we recognize somebody is in their panic zone, is there a way to bring that to light or something they need to discover on their own? Great question. A couple of things, if your whole team speaks the same language of panic zones, uh, then it's easier to say in a, a gentle way, um, is this a good time or are we in the panic zone as uh, in the, or is this conversation in the panic zone? That I find that to be an easy way to introduce that idea. If you have a, a deep connection with somebody, um, with some of my, my uh, closest colleagues, I'm able to say, I feel like you're in your panic zone right now. Is that, is that possible? And the more you normalize getting into the panic zone, the less it is a shaming thing to say. You know, it's kind of like saying, I think you have spinach in your tea. It's hard to say that if you think that is so embarrassing to say to somebody. If you think, well, you know, if you ate spinach, likely it's in your teeth. Not a big deal. I'm just going to let you know. Um, then it can also be an easier way to say it. The other uh, way to bring somebody back from the panic zone often is through empathy, is actually to empathize with the person who's in the panic zone. Because so often in the panic zone, we're thinking, we're feeling like we are alone. And so receiving empathy can make us feel less alone and therefore more likely to become more grounded and therefore movable, influenceable. Um, Dennis says, uh, giving people the opportunity to use their voice when they may otherwise be reluctant to do so, encourage their voices to be heard and provide a space for them to feel comfortable to do so, beautiful. When being invited to be on a panel, ask who else is gonna be in it. Thank you, Jackie. Um, push for a range of voices and decline if necessary, making clear why. Beautiful. And you can even be one of the people who says, I could refer you to a couple of great speakers uh, who are in my same line of work. Uh, the company Six to Start, which makes narrative games, has totally upended how they source their games' stories. They've put in multiple players, sorry, multiple layers in recruitment and final selection to minimize implicit and systemic biases. And all of that started with conversations with the original writers about sharing resources and giving marginalized writers more exposure. Thank you, Tristan. I have a few more to share with you. Um, this here is Gina Martin. She is uh, somebody in the UK campaigning against upskirting and she received a nomination for an OBE uh, recently, which is the Order of the British Empire and she refused. Um, in 2020, 68 people refused out of, you know, 2000 something. So it was 2.7% of people refusing. And that was the highest number so far uh, in history. And so there tends to be a trend toward uh, rejecting this idea of sort of colonialism, empire building, and so forth. This one is an interesting one. This is a festival in 2014 in Australia in Sydney. Um, the festival is called Festival of Dangerous Ideas, and they were putting on a panel about sex workers and sex workers' rights and their welfare and so forth. And interestingly, out of all five panelists, none of them were sex workers. And so leading up to this, to the panel, leading up to the festival, a number of advocates were trying to get sex workers on this panel so that they could speak for themselves, but the conference refused. And so what happened is, um, the actual panel takes place, and then um, as they're getting started, one of the speakers says, actually, I'm going to uh, let somebody else have my spot. And so that she had prearranged uh, a colleague who is a sex worker who had lived, lived experience as a sex worker, um, added her to the panel last moment. And finally, this is not um, a new kind of phenomenon. Marlon Brando declined an Oscar, as you may remember, 1973. He was protesting uh, Hollywood's portrayals of Native Americans in films. Um, so there's a cost and a price sometimes to allyship. It isn't only about more for everyone. Sometimes it means less for me and less for us. Uh, Julie says, if someone shares with you that they are not called on in a meeting, ask if you can forego the chance to share and turn your turn over to them. Beautiful. And that is a, a demonstration of a micro affirmation, right? So sometimes it's about, 
I'm sorry, Chrissy, you didn't finish. I would love to, to hear what you said, what you were going to say, right? So micro affirmation is about uplifting in those moments. You don't just have to say, well, there you go again, Paul, you're cutting everyone off. It could be turning over the mic to Christy. The final thing that we want to focus on today is practicing being uncomfortable, having courageous conversations. So how do we do that? These are things that you probably already know and or practice on a daily basis. Why we have to have courageous conversations is that it becomes a courageous conversation from a regular conversation whenever we address taboo subjects. If talking about um, disability and ableism is a taboo at your workplace, then talking about ableism will become a courageous conversation, quite simply. Uh, sometimes disclosing your identity, disclosing your point of view, disclosing your alliances can become courageous conversations. Certainly when we challenge harmful behavior or language, that takes courage. When we have courageous conversations, they actually require courage because they destabilize people. Of course, when I'm having co courageous conversations, I'm trying to destabilize people as little as possible, not because necessarily that everyone should be protected from feeling their feelings, but because it's more likely that I'll have somebody who's in their stretch zone to talk to. If I'm talking to somebody in their panic zone, or if the way that I'm talking to them brings them into their panic zone or deeper into the panic zone, it's truly a waste of my time, truly, because they're not listening and they're just going through their gestures of panic. Um, often our identities get destabilized in these conversations and of course our relationships get destabilized, right? If somebody uh, imagines you to have alliance with them and then in a conversation you say, no, I, I do think uh, we really messed up here or yeah, we need a new way of doing something then that moment will destabilize uh, some relationships, possibly. Finally, acknowledging, apologizing, and being accountable um, can really be hard. Many of us uh, have been trained and are counted on to be right. Often leadership is also seen as that, whereas uh, many of us know great leaders um, are able to apologize and acknowledge what happened and be accountable. So other than uh, being in our stretch zone as much as we can and practicing that return, getting into our panic zone and coming back to the stretch zone over and over again, and I like to think about that movement from the panic to the stretch as like, you know, when you move through a bunch of thick weeds or something, the first time you go through, it's, it's quite a, a hard walk. Um, because there's a lot of brambles in the way and so forth. But the more you do it, the more you create a path. And so that is truly a, a case where practice makes a difference for an ally. The first time you speak up, the first time you ask a question, the first time um, you take a chance will be the hardest and it will get easier over time. And you will carve a path back over time. One of the things that, of course, requires apologizing, acknowledgement, and accountability uh, is microaggressions, and they happen all the time. Microaggressions, um, you know, you may have seen on the internet surfacing a lot. Um, talking about microaggressions akin to being uh, paper cuts. And I, I like this metaphor because, you know, most of us have gotten paper cuts, if not all of us, and they're not a huge deal. They're not nice, but for most of us, they're not a big deal. But imagine getting a paper cut on top of a paper cut. Before you've even healed, you get another paper cut. It's pretty soon after that, that your cut becomes a wound and it may not ever have a chance to heal, which is why sometimes when another paper cut happens, the reaction to that paper cut seems disproportionate. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, it has accumulated. The effects of the harm has been accumulated. Uh, 
So microaggressions are more than just insults or insensitive comments or, oh, you've used the wrong word. Microaggressions can also include actions. They can include the kinds of questions that somebody is being asked. They can include, um, just like Julie has shared, somebody just being invisibilized often or assumed to be um, the secretary, assumed to be not on the team, taken off an email thread and so forth. They are painful and they do harm in very real ways. They affect our productivity in real ways, they affect our ability to keep coming back to work in real ways. They have to do with a person being in or even perceived to be in a certain group that's discriminated against or subjected to stereotypes. So microaggressions like paper cuts. And sometimes as uh, leaders or as people asked to make decisions, you may find yourself in a position being asked what happened and to adjudicate almost. Did harm happen here? Did something negative happen here? Were you bad? Were you mistaken? Do you need to be punished and so forth? That we're put in these awkward positions. But a client that I was working with um, had this happen at the reception. A trans woman had come to the reception. She filled out a form, uh, gave it back to the receptionist. And then the receptionist said, sorry, you didn't do the back of the form. I need both sides filled. The trans woman who was in the waiting room heard wrong. She heard that the receptionist said, sir, you didn't fill out the back of this form. And so, in other words, she had been misgendered. The experience that she had was being misgendered. And of course, it's not an isolated one moment experience. It is in the context of her life. So she had uh, a huge reaction. She was immensely harmed, immensely hurt. And the receptionist, what, what was the receptionist's experience? I didn't do it. I, like, I actually didn't do it. And then the manager was asked to figure out what to do. And the manager was put in this position of feeling like, well, I have to find out what actually happened and I believe my receptionist. And herein lies a, a really important part of allyship is that it's important to look at impact, not just intention, absolutely no intention and not even um, misbehavior was performed on the receptionist part. But in this case, harm was done. And so what we can do is shift our thinking from a sort of a criminal justice kind of model, like if you do a bad thing and then you get punished, to one where we address harm when they are experienced. When somebody is hurt, we take care of them. We don't say, yeah, but the person who hurt you didn't actually intend it or didn't say the word you thought, therefore no harm done, not true. And so uh, what we need to do in those moments is to recognize that system for the, for the client who had been harmed and she deserves to be taken care of. It doesn't mean that it was the receptionist's fault. And so often it isn't um, a zero sum kind of uh, formula. It's not like if somebody causes five units of pain then somebody will feel five units of pain. The problem with systemic discrimination and injustice is that pain gets cascaded all the time and they happen casually they happen frequently and often often unintended so one tool that i find very useful as an ally is to see that every situation really has multiple layers there's the intention and so often the harm doer the person who is responsible for the harm will want to focus on intention because they want their goodness to be affirmed and there's a place for that. We do not have to say out with your intention. We do not want to talk about it. But we certainly don't want to say it's only about your intention. So who should pay some attention to somebody's intention? Perhaps the manager, perhaps the supervisor, perhaps the person in charge. Really affirm, yeah, you did not intend to do harm. I get it. I get how that feels. I have a toddler and when we tell him that he hit us on the face thinking it was funny, but it's not funny, it's hurtful and I tell him so, 
um, his reaction is so human. He's like, no, I don't want to. And then he does not want to take any of that responsibility because his intention is so clear to him. And we're, we are that human toddler so often. And so somebody can pay some attention to the harm doer's intention, but it does not and probably should not be the person who's harmed, right? She's got a lot going on for herself. So there's the intention, there's the actual behavior, right? In this case, the behavior was, sorry, you didn't fill out the back of the form. In this case, I wouldn't ask for the behavior to be adjusted. In some other cases, I might say to my receptionist, I might say, listen, the impact doesn't match your intention. And therefore, let's adjust the behavior so that the impact matches your good intention, right? That is a, an easy way to correct, quote unquote, something. And then, of course, looking at the impact. And sometimes um, you will find people uh, to say, no, no, the impact is negligible, so no need to change the behavior. I was working with a fire hall where there are uh, a good number of male firefighters, um, maybe 15, 17 male firefighters, and two female firefighters. And we were working on this kind of EDI stuff, and we were talking about sexism and a lot of casual sexist jokes being thrown around. And then all the men were like, okay, okay, we're, we're going to work on that. And the two women both spoke up to say, actually, I don't care. You know, you don't become a, a firefighter as a woman without a thick skin. So go ahead, boys, I don't care. And both women said that. And then the men were confused, like, oh, should we continue then? And the answer, of course, is no. The women in the room are not going to be the gauge of what, um, what is appropriate behavior. So often we do look to the women to tell us what is sexist. We look to queer people to tell us what is homophobic. We look to people of color to tell us whether something is racist. But that is the wrong way about it. We've got to say, actually, sexism doesn't belong in the workplace. It's not cool. And it's fine if you and you feel okay about it. Um, at the same time, it is still inappropriate behavior, so please adjust it. We do not need a negative impact in order to um, ask for good behavior, to uh, demand, in fact, good behavior. Um, and so herein lies the, uh, the, the twist, right? So often we're, we're talking about EDI as if, well, I don't want to offend anyone that that's the motivation. Well, many people, many left-handers, for example, have gotten used to a right-handed world and they've adapted. They've actually learned how to open a can with a right-handed can opener. That does not mean that that can opener is equitable and that you know we don't have a, a problem. So not only looking at impact either. Folks have been sharing um, lots of, uh, lots in the chat. Uh, we've got a, a question around fear of failure, making mistakes, offending others, uh, come up a few times. Um, so how do we do that? How do we balance that fear? Um, I, th I think what I would say to that is about practice and to know that um, the shame that comes from making a mistake and being the person who'd been called out or being the person who worries about not knowing um, is a fair price to pay for having the privilege and the power in whatever realm it is that I'm, I'm feeling nervous about. Um, and there isn't sort of a magic potion to, to let that go away. If I wait until I don't feel uh, nervous about making a mistake in order to take a risk, that won't happen. A lot of the trust that I'm going to build with people around me comes from me taking those risks. Tristan shares, uh, from my own experience, telling someone who's reported a microaggression to you about how hard you're working to acknowledge that microaggressions are real and how most people would handle it poorly is not helpful to the process. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for sharing that. So I wanted to uh, take the final 10 minutes we have to share some concrete things, really concrete things that we can do, because a lot of this 
allyship stuff is about taking action. It's about moving from I become aware, I understand, I empathize, I sympathize. I'm signing on, you know, I want to be, I want to be on your team to really taking some action. So here are seven things um, out of many that I can think of. And what I'm going to do is invite you also to put into the chat other concrete things. And I'm going to ask you very specifically to make it concrete. So if you're thinking, have hard conversations, tell us which conversation with whom and what are you going to say? If you're thinking, you know, um, donate money, say to where, to whom, to what kind of causes, um, make it super concrete. So here are seven uh, that I'm proposing. One, check your chairs in your office or in your company. Check that you have some chairs that have arms on them because some folks cannot get up out of a chair unless they have arms. Check the width. If you only have chairs that have arms that are quite narrow, people with larger bodies do not fit in those chairs and it's very uncomfortable to be stuck in a chair. And to check your chairs for steadiness. If you only have chairs that have wheels on them and you cannot get up on, um, off of them easily without um, wobbling, that can also be really challenging for people who may be unsteady on their feet. That was a lesson I learned uh, from Roxane Gay, who talks about often walking into a room. She's an author, a feminist, and uh, an activist. And uh, she also has a larger body. And she talks about how many rooms she has been in where no chair would fit her body and what it feels like to be the person who says, do you have something else that I can see? To include your gender pronouns right there on your screen like joe has like tristan has and not leaving it to just the people who are using gender pronouns that are less common right so often the assumption is well look at me it's pretty obvious i use that pronoun so i'm not gonna you know go out of my way to to claim it i'm gonna let the people who use they or z to actually do it but actually by doing it you're signaling that this is a place where or I don't expect you to make assumptions about my pronouns, and I'm going to try not to make assumptions about your pronouns. Likely is, I will sometimes still make assumptions and get it wrong. To ditch groups as put downs, words like lame, crazy, dumb, gay as a put down, jip, OCD as a way of describing that you might be tense about something, that you might be very specific about something, that might be you you're anxious about something to actually say what you mean, you know, instead of saying that is so crazy, maybe you mean that is so ridiculous. It was unbelievable. It was intense. I was laughing so hard. I peed myself. You know, what do you mean when you say these shorthands to check appropriation? Are you using terms like powwow to mean, oh, we're just going to have a quick meeting. Are you using words, uh, phrases like, you know, I'm the low man on the totem pole? Why we want to not use those terms is that they actually come from a casual appropriation of ideas that most of us don't understand very well. These are sacred objects and ceremonies, sacred events that have been casually appropriated to mean, let's just do a quick chat. So why not say it? Let's do a quick chat about this. To audit your washrooms for safety. What, what does that mean? Does somebody like me feel comfortable going to the washroom in your company, in your organization? You know, do you have gendered bathrooms? If so, are there other options for someone who doesn't neatly fit into a binary gender? Do you have single stall washrooms? Is it wide enough to fit a wheelchair? And so forth. Many places are moving towards all gender washrooms for that reason. To talk about the center, right? To name what is dominant, right? So I'm going to consider in introducing myself as a right hand person sometimes versus only letting the left handers have to remark on their left handedness. Otherwise, we assume everyone's right handed. So that means I might say, Hey, um, you, I heard that you need a mechanic. I'm going to send you to my 
guy. He's a, a white guy in his 50s. I trust him with my life, right? So naming the things that we often leave unnamed, like whiteness, like straightness, and so forth. That's part of the privilege that, that, that is part of what comes with privilege. To start a book or course and to talk to others about it. Say, I'm starting this course and this is what I learned today. Of course, you may earn the, um, you know, the, the moniker of being the nerd in the room or the, the geek in the room. And you will also help others know that it's all right to, to take that course or to start that book and maybe they want to join you. So those are things um, I'm thinking that you could do today, later on today. Tomorrow, so slightly longer term, start a leader mentorship program. Be a sponsor within it. It makes a huge difference, right? Many of us know connections make the difference, make all the difference. Having somebody to introduce you to important people in the same industry, to bring you to an event, to drop your name once in a while, to include you on an email chain, to tell you about a program that comes up. So often it's not because we are ill intention on leaving somebody out. It's just that we don't think of it. So um, having a mentor and having sponsors really help people move and advance their careers and become included. Acknowledge your bias and your mistakes when they surface. Um, it surfaces all the time. I was on a flight to LA a few years ago and, you know, just as we're about to take off, the captain comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to take off and into the beautiful skies towards Los Angeles. And it was a woman's voice. And my gut reaction in that moment truly was like, oh my God, we're going to die. Interesting. I am a feminist. I work against sexism. That is my stated position. And what is my gut reaction, my emotions, my unconsciously ingrained bias? Women don't drive giant airplanes. I should not expect myself to be an exception to my conditioning, and neither should you. I have always lived in a sexist world. And so when my sexism shows against women, I got to know that it's real, it's true, and it's okay to be honest with myself about it. I don't have to run to the cockpit and tell the captain and say, oh my God, I just thought you were going to kill me. But it is important to live with that honesty versus more and more in this world, we have um, pressure to be only our stated position and pretend we never have those thoughts. Pretend that if I think all bodies are beautiful and perfect as they are, that I don't pull on jeans and think, oh gosh, I don't like my thighs, right? We can be stated positions, body positive, working towards it and still experience emotions that are different. It happens all the time. So acknowledging biases, mistakes, because you are not an exception to the conditioning you are part of to update your intake processes, be that new clients, be that new employees, so that you widen the door. This is why we wanna do this work, is to widen the door, not because we don't wanna get in trouble, not because we don't wanna cause offense. I really like the framing of, just open the door to my living room as wide as possible. I'm not gonna open it wider because you need it and you need it. I'm just gonna keep it as wide as I know how. Number four, to ensure your personnel policies, cover all kinds of things, including, for example, parental leave for all different genders, different ways of becoming a family. Does it cover that? Redistribute an opportunity of yours to somebody else. I have been uh, invited twice to co-keynote with somebody, um, another person who is much more established, uh, in the field to just co-keynote. She speaks for half the time, I speak for half the time. The exposure is amazing. The experience of an opportunity is amazing. Create a policy for gender pronouns on your badges, on your emails and stuff like that. 
ask questions about team culture to those that are most marginalized within your organization. You know, um, one of my favorite reads on the internet is 12 things that good bosses believe. Some of you may know it. It's on uh, Harvard Business Review. And, you know, it's a list of 12 things. And the first thing that good bosses believe, according to this article, is I have a flawed and incomplete understanding of what it feels like to work for me. Flawed and incomplete. And number 12, the last one to close it up, is because I wield power over others, I am at great risk of acting like an insensitive jerk and not realizing it. And so find out how somebody can actually reflect team culture back to you. When you leave a room, what happens to the room? Sometimes it's just a feedback loops, a feedback um, structure. And other times uh, you may actually need something more uh, anonymous, um, something that includes you know, outside consultants and so forth. But it's really need, important to know uh, your team culture. So I'm going to leave it at that and I'll leave you with this quote specifically. It's from Leela Wilson, a uh, Watson, sorry, uh, who is an indigenous activist. It says, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, because we're all part of a system, then let us work together. So no need for your charity or your benevolence but definitely a need for you to recognize that you're part of the system, just like I am part of the system that, you know, perpetuates sexism, even as a woman. So our liberation is bound up together. Thank you so much for being with me for this time and for listening and for your input throughout. I'm going to pause there and um, hand it back to Diane and Bethan. Great. Thank you so much, BK. I have taken a page and a half of notes, and I really appreciate that you've given us things we can do now and things that we can share. So talk, talk to people, get comfortable with shame, understand shame, understand our humanity, our humility, and let's all be in this together. Thank you for such a great session. I'll make sure, well, this recording will go out, but uh, we'll make sure, BK, you get a copy because you missed uh, Fazia Bogman's presentation for poet, poetry this morning. So we'll get that out to you. But take good care, you. enjoy your family, and stay warm. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. you. Take bye -bye. good care, everyone. Bye-bye.